Welcome to another resource for living life with wisdom, purpose, and faith. Brought to you by Shepherd's Heart Ministries. Shepherd's Heart is a 501c3 evangelical nonprofit located in Bozeman, Montana. Join us for one of our many events in the Gallatin Valley as we seek the lost, strengthen the found, and together shine more brightly for Jesus. And now, on to today's resource. Tonight we have a treat to hear Jim Kena. Jim is the head pastor over at Be Free on South 19th. Been around a long time in Bozeman. How many years now, Jim? Nine years in Bozeman. Uh, a phenomenal Bible teacher. I'm just going to leave it at that. One of my all-time favorites, and I enjoy your stuff so much, Jim. Love your spirit, your demeanor, how you come across, and how you just kind of slyly shake us up. <laughs> so come up and join us. Give Jim a hand. Am I on? Yeah, oh, oh, good, good. All right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, I love talking to men, and uh, well, we're just going to share some about what a, what a man is, what a man is. So let me pray for us, and then, and then we'll get started. Uh, Father, thank you for the privilege to stand before uh, these men to share your word about what you're calling us up to, to fulfill in our unique redemptive purpose. So uh, I ask for a filling of your Holy Spirit. I pray that each of us will be sensitive to your spirit's work and your words, uh, uh, direct uh, confrontation and teaching and instruction to us. Uh, so we commit this time to you. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If all goes well, I'll talk for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to have about 15 minutes of table time where you can discuss and kind of uh, talk about what uh, I've talked about. So um, uh, last night I was doing some uh, premarital counseling for a couple that are non-Christians, they don't go to church. Uh, she's a coworker, my wife, and was looking for a pastor. And uh, I had enough of a relationship with them that uh, they asked me if I'd do their wedding. I said, yeah, if you'll do some premarital counseling uh, with me. And so it's really neat for me as a pastor, a Christian pastor, to meet, be with two non-church, non-Christian people who really don't have a great interest in spiritual things. They really, even talk about it, we don't want to go to church. I go, great, because I thought this is a good opportunity. So I met with them last night and, uh, you know, the topic came up and said, hey, I'm going to talk to a bunch of men uh, tonight. And uh, I said, I'm going to talk about what a, what a, what a man is. And uh, I think I kind of asked the question, you know, what, what do you think a man is? And I didn't give them a long time to, uh, to, to formulate their answer because I like to talk a lot. So I just kind of cut right in. <clears throat> but I said, you know, what is a man? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell them tomorrow night. And so I gave them a definition I'm going to give you. It was so cool because here they're sitting there, you know, totally uncharged, and they're going, yeah, yeah. And she on her face goes, yeah, yeah. Because she wants him to do what I'm going to tell you guys to do. <coughs> it was so cool because it resonated with both of them. Because what we're experiencing, though, is a manhood crisis in our culture where we really don't know who we are, how God has made us, and what we're all about. And that culture, in a post-Christian culture we have uh, with broken families and so on, understanding who we are as a man is challenging. So what I want to talk about is what is a man? And here's some of my goals for our evening this evening. I want to look at three areas of responsibility for men, men in general. Then uh, we're going to look at two examples of manhood, and then I want to close with the definition of what authentic biblical masculinity is. But let's start uh, with uh, developing this biblical de definition by going to Scripture. And so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and grab them. And uh, uh, this is going to be real easy to find. Uh, if the Bibles, I'm going to use the ESV, which is what you have there in the middle. Um, it'll be easy to find. Go to page one. <laughs> Genesis 1. And Genesis is kind of organized like this. There's this, uh, Genesis 1 has this wide angle view of creation, and especially men and women in particular. Then chapter 2, there's a close-up look 
And then chapter three, it draws a tight focus of who they are. So let's just look real quick at uh, Genesis chapter one. Uh, there's this wide angle view of God creating male and female. Genesis one, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. So we see God as creator, creating men and women. And as distinctive as this, they're created in God's image. Theologians use this Latin term to describe this, imago Dei. Imago Dei means that every human being, male, female, is created in the image of God. What is one of the clearest evidences for God? You. You. Because what he did with humans, among all other animals, he elevated them to this highest status and he shared some of his image with humanity, male and female. Every person you meet has some of the attributes that God himself shared with them. So you can look at each other and get a little glimpse of what God is like in a, in a miniature degree. He shared his attributes with us. So we're image bearers. We have inherent worth and value, male and female. God created them. So we have value, and then we have a purpose. This theological term is called a cultural mandate. You see this in verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Uh, Psalm, uh, oh, I didn't write it down. Psalm somewhere <laughs> says that God made man a little lower than the angels and he crowned them with glory and honor. And then there's this description of us being over animals. We're not animals. We're image bearers of God. And we have been given this responsibility Again, theologians call this a cultural mandate to create culture, to, uh, to rule over culture, and to make things better even. And so he's given this mandate to them to be fruitful and multiply and to subdue the earth and to create because God is a creative God. He made us creative. So that's the wide angle view, chapter one. Uh, chapter two then we see three areas of responsibility. And, and in particular, we want to draw our focus just a little bit tighter and look at this first man. His name is Adam. Uh, Hebrew, that means the man. Pretty creative for the first guy. And there's only one. You know, who, who are you? The man. No one else. I'm the man. So here's going to be three areas of responsibility. And this is kind of unpacking some of what I said to uh, uh, the guy last night and the couple. Uh, the first thing we see in these three areas of responsibility is that God gave a man a work to do. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to keep it. Work is ordained for us before sin. Sin didn't create this necessity to work. We have always been creative beings meant to work and do things productive. So before the fall, we were created to work. And one of the things is this, is that God gives a man a work to do. You as a man have a work to do. Adam was created that way. And as we move on into the New Testament uh, 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 revelation of what a man or what a person is, he talks about us being right with God. And he says, for by grace, you've been saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here's one element of a responsibility of every man is we're here to work, to fulfill our redemptive purpose and to move it even more so into a Christian context. You have been gifted before the foundation of the world with those things that God can use in you to accomplish his glory in your work. 
The one responsibility for every man is to work, to be creative and fulfill that redemptive purpose, to fulfill what God has called us to do. Second thing is this. God gave him a work to do, and then also God gave him a will to obey. We see this in the very next verses, uh, chapter 2, verse 16 and 17 of Genesis. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat up every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. I remember doing a Bible study with uh, John and Su Ling Lim. They were Chinese uh, they, they had a, uh, what was it, a Buddhist background. I forgot their background, but they were both not Christians. So this is like the first time we opened the Bible with these, with these Chinese students that we'd known a long time ago. So I, I shared this verse. I remember so clearly John's uh, kind of surprise when we, when we saw this, this particular t- t- text about the, the tree in the middle and, and then them taking it. And we were talking about the creation story. And, and he looked at me and he looked up at me and he goes, God's plan is flawed. God's plan is flawed. Why did he put the tree in the middle? And I said, the tree had to be there. Because if they were to be image bearers of God, they were to be volitional beings with the capacity to choose. And what the tree in the middle enabled them to do is to make a choice. Do you want to stay with God or not? They had a choice to make. And so it was necessary for them to be image bearers of God for the tree to be in there. So they put the tree in there and there was, God put the tree in there and there was just, you know, there wasn't 10 commandments. There's just one. Don't eat. Don't eat. That's it. Again, you know, there's not much mischief to get into when you're alone. Uh, But uh, he said, just don't eat of the tree because the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So here was this also, God gave man a will to obey, a work to do and a will to obey. And God wants to be in relationship with us. God wants to be the authority, the leader in our life, and he wants us to obey his will. There is a will that God has for you to obey. Real men accept that responsibility. They walk in obedience. The next thing is this, is in in, in verse 18. Then the Lord said, uh, the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And we see the story of the creation then of Eve, where a rib was taken from Adam and she was formed from that. And she was a helper suitable for him. I remember doing a wedding uh, or some premarital counseling for one couple of years ago. I said, describe your wife to me. And she goes, she's my missing rib. I thought that was pretty cool. She kind of completes what's not there for me. And so she was his missing rib, that fulfillment of what he was. And so what we see here is is it was not good for him to be alone. And so God gave man a, a woman to love. So this is a story of these three responsibilities that God has given us a work to do, a will to obey, and normally a woman to love. Now, he had to have a woman to be fruitful and multiply. But not every man has to be married. It's not God's call in their life to be married. But the majority are. But there is this woman that you're to love. So we we have these three examples from from this close focus. Now we want to move into more of a tight focus. And what I want to do at this point is give you two examples of masculinity. Um, a prototype and an anti-type. Prototype, you follow this one. The anti-type, you don't follow this example. They're put in contrast with us. And so we're going to look at the example of Adam as, a, as eventually we're going to see an anti-type. This is what a man isn't to be. This isn't how a man is not to live. And you learn from this negative example. So we see this as we go on in Genesis chapter 3. In this story of the creation account of who he is, and now we move in a tight focus of the fall, and we look carefully what happened. Now, Genesis 3.1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 
And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent, this is a manifestation of the evil one, Satan. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and also she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Here we see the fall. The one will that he was given to obey, he violated. He ate as well of this fruit that was forbidden. And so we see this example of Adam, who he had a will to obey, but as an anti-type of what manhood is to be, he walked in this disobedience to what God called him to be. Here's an anti-type of masculinity. They walk in disobedience to God's will. They're defiant to his authority and his will and his way. Uh, here, here's our problem. We want to be like God. Because I want to be God, Jim. I want to be master of me. I don't want to bring myself under the will and the authority of the creator God who created me. He's our anti-type. But we put also not just an anti-type, what scripture has as a prototype of what authentic masculinity is all about. And he's called by theologians sometimes the second Adam is Jesus Christ. He is our example of what God has called us to do. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For it because of one man's trespass, he's talking of Adam, this one man, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteous reign through the life of the one man, Jesus Christ. The one man, Adam, because of his sin, and since he's our great, 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 grandpa, and we're in his lineage, we too were born with this fallen nature. We were born sinners by, by nature and choice. There's that bent that Adam have that we follow. And because of his sin, it spread to all of his descendants, us. But Jesus Christ stood in contrast, and he gives righteousness. I like this first Adam, second Adam uh, uh, contrast in 1 Corinthians 15.45. Uh, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The last Adam is Jesus. So he puts the anti-type Adam, the prototype Jesus, and this is what he says about Adam. He was a living being, but Jesus, the prototype, the second Adam, is a life-giving spirit. You ever had to fill out like a, or do like a, a reference call for someone who's trying to find a job and, and, and they are like completely worthless. And you're just scrambling around to say something good about them. And they're saying, what kind of guy is he? Is a good guy, so on? And this is what you say. Well, he's a living being. <laughs> That's what Paul does about Adam. Here's his reference. Well, he was a living being. But Jesus is a life-giving spirit. And that's our example, men. Do you bring life? Or are you just suck air? Are you a living being or a life-giving spirit? And we as Christ followers follow the prototype, not the anti-type. And that we become life-giving spirits. Think about work. Are you a life-giving spirit at work? Are you a life-giving spirit to your wife? Are you a life-giving spirit to your children? Are you a life-giving spirit in your church? 
Do you add to culture or do you suck from culture? Are you a living being or a life-giving spirit? So we see these two examples of, of Adam who failed the test and Jesus who passed the test. And every man is going to make a decision to walk in the shadow of one or the other. So one of the things I told you to do is I'll, I'll give you a, a definition of, of authentic masculinity. And for those of you who've been in, in men's fraternity, this is just lifted right from it. Uh, it, it is no creativity on my part. Uh, I sucked it from somebody else. And then I give it to you as a life-giving spirit, I guess. Uh, so here it is. Uh, we're going to develop this, this definition. So what is the definition looking at our prototype and our anti-type? Uh, one element, I think, of a biblical definition of what a real man is, is first of all, uh, they reject passivity. They reject passivity. So let's look at our anti-type, uh, uh, Adam, who is in the garden. Uh, come back to that verse 6 in chapter 3. This is what he says. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was able, uh, was to be desired to make one wise, uh, she took of the fruit and ate it. And this is what I always thought growing up. It wasn't until I studied this later in life. I thought that when the serpent tempted Eve, that Adam was out playing basketball or farming or something and then he comes back, he goes, what has happened here? That's not the way it was. Did you see what it says in the text? And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. It seems as if to imply that Adam's watched the evil one tempt his wife. And he just stood there as a life-breathing spirit. And he was passive. Uh, I am uh, 56 years old. I've been married 35 years. Uh, I, I love being this age. And I look back at my life, and there are not a lot of things that I've done that I regret. I've been faithful to my wife. I, I've stayed out of jail. Uh, I pay my debts. We got a nice house. You know, there's not a lot of, you know, I got a good job, all that. There are not a lot of things I look at that, I, that I've done that I regret but there are a lot of things I regret that I haven't done that I should have done. For him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. And, and when we walk in the anti-type of Adam, one of the things we do is we're passive. Men, God did not create us to be passive. He wants us to exert authority and rule and be leaders, not be passive. And I bet many of you think of moments when you sit there with your hands in your pocket and you watched <laughs> evil unfold in front of you. And you did not step in and intervene and you didn't stop it, but you came complicit with it and engaged with it because after she sinned, she offered it to him and he took. That will to obey he violated, but he also violated because he didn't stop in and become the head of the family that God calls us to be, to protect his bride. He was passive. The, the, the prototype is anything but passive. Jesus is active in his pursuit of us, and he was active in his entrance to time and eternity to die on the cross for us, Jesus is not passive, he's active. And no one looks at Jesus and goes, well, he's pretty laid back and passive. And so part of the definition of this is that a, a real man rejects passivity. Next thing we see also in this text is that a real man will accept responsibility. Uh, he will re accept responsibility. Uh, go back to the Genesis text that we've been looking at. And in this Genesis text in chapter 3, look how he responds when he is encountered by God with his sin. When he was caught by God, he's cornered, and God confronts him with this, and this is what he does. He says in verse 13, uh, or excuse me, uh, 
Let me just back up a little bit here. Verse 10. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. God began looking for him. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. When confronted with his sin, he rejected responsibility. And he began to make excuses, cast blame, and play the victim. God, it was the woman that you gave me. He rejected responsibility for the sin as the head of the family. And what we see in the anti-type of masculinity is this failure to accept responsibility. This is what the word responsibility is, 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 is built upon. You are response-able. You have an ability to respond and make decisions. And what we have in our culture is millions of adolescent males who don't man up and take responsibility for their actions, and they spend their time in excuse-making, blame-shifting, and victimization of themselves. It's not my fault. And that's part of the old Adam. And Jesus Christ rejects the passivity, and he accepts responsibility, and he pursues us as well. Because what we see in Christ is this. We see him, first of all, he accepted the responsibility of God's will to obey. This is what uh, John 4.34 says. Jesus said to them, my food, my passion is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus, the prototype of authentic masculinity, he accepted the responsibility of the work that God has given us. When we hear that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, do good works, so he prepared in advance for us to do, a man says, I'll do it. I will accept responsibility and I will do the work that God has called me to do. Next thing in Jesus, we see that not only did he accept the responsibility, uh, obey the will, but he accepted responsibility to the work to do. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that God, that you gave me to do. John 17, 4. If some of you were in our church and I was preaching not too long ago, I said, I have figured out what I want engraved on my tombstone. John 17, 4. Where Jesus says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. Wouldn't that be awesome? engrave that on your tombstone. That I glorify God when I lived here on earth by doing the work he called me to do. That is that will to obey, that work to do. And also, Jesus accepted the responsibility of a woman to love. Now, he never married. And Jesus is the supreme prototype of a man that he loved his woman because his woman is the church, the bride of Christ. And this is what it says in Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So here we see in Jesus the prototype. He took responsibility to obey the will of the Father, do the work he called to do, and to love his bride as Christ loved the church. One of the things, when I was with the couple, they're not churched. I use kind of a variation of, of, of uh, this idea of, of what a man's all about. And it's from uh, John Eldridge's book, Wild at Heart. And John Eldridge said this, that there's three things that a man's supposed to do. It, it, there's an adventure to live, a battle to fight, and a beauty to rescue. I'm telling you what, when I told that guy, the, hu the husband-to-be, and his bride-to-be was right there, I said, part of his role is a beauty to rescue. She lit up. And she knows my wife because she works with my wife. And I said, you know what? I think, without boasting, I think my wife is very, very beautiful inside and out. And this coworker, well, she is. I just really love your wife. I really look up to her. I said, not bragging, but I, I really think that what's happened is because I've tried to love her the best I can her beauty has radiated even more. 
There is a countenance about her because I pursue her and I want to love her. And I want to release that beauty within her. And so Jesus loves his bride, the church. He loves you passionately, and he wants to release that beauty within you. Uh, so this definition then is a uh, real man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, and then he leads courageously. Uh, Adam hid because he was afraid. And one of the things that will keep you from your redemptive purpose is fear. And what we need in culture, society is men to take the lead. To step up in, in your sphere, in your culture, and create culture, to lead your families, to, to take the initiative. And we see in the prototype of Jesus, his, his leadership, his ability to move forward. There was a, a, there's a point in the story, the Adam story in verse 9, God calls out to the man, and this is what Adam says, where are you? And it's like God's voice still echoes to creation. Where are you, men? Where are you to step up and fulfill your redemptive purpose? Where are you? And he was hiding because he was afraid. So this development of this manhood definition is we reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, and then we invest eternally. He disobeyed God for an apple. He rejected paradise and Eve, Eden for a sensual taste of something that looked good to the eyes, for the appeal of being like God. And he didn't invest eternally, he thought short-sightedly. And part of being a, a prototype, a follower of, of Jesus Christ, of this authentic masculinity, is that, that we invest our lives in things of eternal worth. That, that we want to make an eternal significance of what God has called us to do. Adam invested in the temporary, choosing what would satisfy him in the moment. And one of the signs of adolescent behavior is a lack of impulse control and, and of experiencing delayed gratification. And we need to learn the delayed gratification of eternity that we will fulfill our redemptive purpose here and now. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourself treasures on heaven where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in. Well, I've gone a little bit over my time, but I have one story and stories don't count for time. Uh, uh, when we, when we, I was pastoring in Arkansas and, uh, we were going through a tough period of time and, and uh, we were going through a tough period in our marriage and just, you know, just a lot of pressures, a lot of things going on to us. And uh, 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 so we decided, I decided, Kim, let's just go to some counseling because, you know, we're just not clicking right now and all the stress and so on. So I remember we went to a counseling, a marriage counseling. And uh, uh, frankly, uh, the counselor lady, uh, she didn't do any good. Uh, but what was good is me saying, we got problems, let's go talk. I mean, that was the huge thing. I, it really was. I think that was the big thing. But I remember when, at one point, uh, uh, we were sitting there talking and she was doing the counselor talk stuff, you know, and she looked at me and she goes, uh, what, what, what do you dream of doing? If you could do anything in the world, what, what would you dream? What, what would you do? And I thought that's really a good question. You know? Because it kind of determines, well, what's that work that God's calling us to do? What's that area of passivity I need to, to reject? What are those responsibilities I need to take? It really begins to, you know, what is that dream? And, and I told her, I said, you know, and I'd been past this church and I, I, there had been this tug in my heart. I said, if I could do anything right now, I would quit the church and I would move and go to seminary somewhere so that I could further my education. Because what I had in mind then is I wanted to teach in, in a, a Christian university and prepare the next generation of, of leaders. And uh, I remember, you know, there was all these things, you know, we had four kids at home and all this going on and uh, life seemed really just full and complicated. And, and so I just told her what my dream was. And uh, then, you know how it is kind of in counseling. And then, you know, she turns and says the same thing to Kim. And so 
rather than listening to Kim, I just kind of put my head down like this. I was listening to Kim. But I, I put my head down, and there was like this, you know how this, it's like an impression. You know, like I didn't hear a voice or anything, but just this really clear thought came to my head. This is what it was. We'll do it. And I thought, I go, we could do this. And we sold our house. I mean, it was so beautiful. I, I told Kim, I, uh, I, I, I called Kim up when I was going to break the news that we're going to sell our house, move my wife and four kids to what wound up being Chicago. We didn't even know where we were going to go. And uh, here I am in my 40s. Now I think of my midlife crisis. Uh, so anyway, at least I didn't leave my wife. I just took her with me. Uh, but anyway, I, I called Kim up. I said, hey, I want to go out for lunch and talk to you. So uh, she's all excited because she gets to go for lunch. You know, it's, oh, great. And so we get in the car at the church where I was pastoring. Uh, she, she hops in the car with me. We, we back out the car and I turned to her. I said, Kim, I'm going to resign the church. We're going to sell our house and I'm going to move and, and enroll in seminary. And this is what my wife said. Let's do it. Because she knew I loved her. And she knew I would listen to the voice of God. And I really believe we did it. And we did it. We sold our house, left Arkansas, moved to Chicago, enrolled in seminary, spent four years there. And then a job opened at Arkansas, at the Christian University that I wanted to teach at. And they didn't hire me. <laughs> and so I had to go to plan B. Bozeman. <laughs> and I'm so glad I'm here. God puts stuff in us. It may not be that big, but that was a moment of, of rejecting passivity, of accepting responsibility, of leading courageously, and investing in the eternal. That decision is what determined me standing here today talking to you. And I'm glad I'm talking to you. Because being the man that God created us to be is one of the most fulfilling experiences in the world. I get to influence people for Jesus Christ in eternity. I get to stand in front of a group of, what is there, 500 here? 1,000 here, yeah. 1,000 men and share the beauty of the gospel and call men out to masculinity. I just love this. And there's something in you that God created you to do, and you love it. You do it. Uh, I'll pray. You can break up in your groups and uh, talk about What's a man? So let me pray. Father, thank you for uh, uh, Doug and Daniel and their leadership, their courageous leadership, their willingness to, to uh, organize this event. And we pray that your spirit would do your profound work in us. I, I pray that we'd be men who, uh, who reject passivity, that we accept responsibility, that we lead courageously, and we invest our lives in eternal matters. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening to this resource by Shepherd's Heart Ministries. For more resources, subscribe to our channel, like us on Facebook, or sign up for our newsletter. If you're encouraged by these resources and would like to contribute financially, visit us on our website at www.shepherdsheartmen.org. Your generosity will help us seek the lost, strengthen the found, and together shine more brightly for Jesus.